In part two, I conclude my conversation with Kevin Myers. If we take a, a broad view of Ireland as, as it is, as you perceive it today, within your lifetime, and that doesn't stretch back to 1916, but within your lifetime and allowing for the fact that you spent some of that lifetime outside the country, do you see any particular turning point whereby if Ireland had gone in a different direction, things would have turned out differently, perhaps better than they have from your point of view? Well, from the point of view of perceptions of history, the, the most important single event uh, was the bo IRA bombing of the Enniskilling um, Remembrance Sunday service in 1987, in November 1987. I had been campaigning for the previous eight years or so uh, for, the, for Ireland to acknowledge um, the historic fact you don't have to prove it, just a historic fact that maybe a quarter of a million Irishmen served in British forces during in the Great War. This had been completely occluded from all public uh, memory or public ceremony. And uh, most of my writings had been in vain on this. Uh, but the IRA blew the uh, Inner Skillin uh, Remembrance Service apart, killing 11 people, maiming scores. The, a neighbouring bomb in a place called Tully Humman should have killed another 20 people. That The intention was it was placed precisely where the boys' brigade and the girls' brigade were gathering. So that was intended to have a mass slaughter. And uh, Irish people did ask serious questions about the way that the state perceives uh, our history. And um, that had a transformative effect. And I could see that in Remembrance Sunday when I was started going there in 1978. It, it was half full. And thereafter, after um, the Enniskillen bombings, um, the church, the cathedral was always full. I mean, the, the, the most obvious transformative effect in terms of uh, economic culture and uh, the ec economy generally came with the, um, the Ken Whitaker transformations in 1959. That was before my time in Ireland. I was a child then. But it, it, it had a, an enormous effect on, on Ireland. And we can see now it was the gateway to an entirely new, new Ireland. It didn't appear so at the time. Mm. But it, it, you can't control change once you've opened up your economy. That's, that's going to happen anyway. That seems to be the, the, the dilemma that we either have, we either close the doors completely or we open the doors completely. And we had a period, maybe what would be regarded as the devil era, period where the doors were firmly closed and then they were opened once Lamas and Whitaker got their hands on the tiller. Perhaps. Well the doors were always open in De Valera's time but they were open in only one direction for people to leave Yeah, yeah. That, and that's what made, <laughs> that's what made that state yes, possible yeah, yeah. That it was economically unsustainable and mm. the, the people like the Myerses had to leave because yeah. of the limited economic opportunities that isolation had brought I don't mind uh, that we have an immigration policy that isn't a policy, if that's discussed. If you're able to say, I actually am opposed to mass immigration, and here's why. What happens if you say that is you're denounced as a racist, a, a xenophobe, as I have been, uh, repeatedly, by the political classes and by the, by the current president, Michael D. Higgins? When I did actually write, refer 10, 15, 15 years ago to the, the perils of immigration, he denounced me. He called me his, um, he said uh, my piece was uh, on immigration was um, artful cowardice because I had deliberately avoided saying something that would be against the law. Mm. Uh, but that's the cowardly bit. And the artfulness was, was the guile which I exhibited in saying that. It was a disgusting observation. But it's actually representative of how dissent is now treated in, in Irish life. And we, we have self-appointed archbishops in Irish life now, and they are self-appointed, but they impose the secular vision on, on, on the world. And in many ways, it's as difficult to represent or speak uh, in the voices of dissent now as it was in the 1950s. Well, I can remember the, the penalties for dissent in the 1950s and 60s were eternal damnation because uh, if you sinned, you might be the only person who knows you've sinned, but nevertheless, God also knew and you would end up in a fiery place. So what are the penalties for dissent today? Silencing. 
abuse, silencing the lynch mob. We, we saw it happen to me uh, two and a half years ago. Um, I admit there was a couple of clumsy sentences. They, 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 they both, they, all my, uh, um, all I said was was meant to be a compliment to the two women broadcasters mm. I referred to. Genuine is meant to be a compliment. Um, it was misrepresented and um, turned into something it wasn't and wasn't intended to be. And then that uh, the allegations of anti-Semitism from a man that the Jewish community in Ireland specifically defended then and ever since were transformed then into misogynistic allegations as well. So I became an anti-Semite misogynist in the matter of hours uh, in 2017. And my reputation was publicly destroyed. And what was done to me was criminal. It was a monstrous injustice, but basically it was criminal. Mm. And uh, it was a, a marker and a warning for any younger journalist. Don't ever, ever depart from the norms. Don't say anything that suggests men and women are different, which is something all your listeners know. Everyone, without exception, apart from the media elite and the political elite, everyone knows, without exception, that men and women are different. We, not merely are we shaped different, we've got different chromosomes, um, uh, we've got different bodies, we've got different aspirations, we've got different appetites, uh, and we have different, uh, different chromosomes and different hormones, and, and so on and so forth. But even to advert to this now is to invite um, accusations, terminal accusations of misogyny. Is that the, is that the practical problem uh, with dissent today? There is a... Uh, um, a penalty which is not just a, an abstract penalty, it's a real penalty which affects people's livelihood. Well, it is the eternity that you were referring earlier on to the Catholic Church. But m my eternity is secular and mm. it's temporal and you know, it's, it's, it's unlikely that we have an afterlife. The, the eternity that I have now entered of silence is, is uh, you know, it's, 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 it's equivalent thereof. And if I were 27 years of age rather than, you know, over 45 years older than that... Um, I would not dream of saying anything that would provoke the wrath of our new archbishops. Well, that's the problem. And I remember, um, it must be 10 or 15 years ago, reading a letter, which I haven't been able to find since, in one of the mainstream papers, from the, the former editor of a, a national newspaper in the 60s, who wrote in to apologise for his cowardice during that period, because he was aware of the level of... Um, paedophilia going on in the Catholic Church, particularly in one institution. And he'd, he spiked the story because he was afraid of the um, um, penalties that would arrive at his doorstep from the church, particularly Archbishop McQuaid. And he wanted to put on the record that he had been a coward. Now, there were one or two people at that time who wanted to raise the issues which were subsequently raised many years later. And for one reason or another, didn't do it. And I wonder, is, is it a case of the more things change, the more things remain the same? Yeah, but the interesting thing is that the, the Irish norms, the official norms, are as intolerant today as they were in the 1950s. And the penalties are roughly comparable. Nobody would have dared cross uh, John Charles McQuaid in the 1950s. And any sin of a sexual nature, and in particular of a sexual nature, would be rewarded with eternal damnation. That's what the, the logic was. That, that was the, the penal code that was applied. Um, and we have a comparable, not identical, even similar, but comparable a penal code. Now, as if, if you depart from the norm, uh, your career is over. You will be isolated. You will have the ability to earn nothing. Now, this is not uniquely Ireland. Because mm. it's true all over the world. I was going to but, ask you that. Yeah, was it yeah. particularly Irish? Thing it it was thing? uniquely Irish at, at, once, at one level, or particularly Irish. But what's happened is we've incorporated a, a comparable moral and penal code from the, the li left liberal agenda from around the world. So that I couldn't say in New York or San Francisco today... Uh, what I actually believe, that um, homosexual marriage is not the same and not equal to um, heterosexual marriage. The heterosexual marriage is the core of civilization. It is the basis mm -hmm. from which family arises. And without that kind of marriage and without women producing babies, we haven't got a society. And that, that the simple core fact all over Europe and all over America is that every woman 
has to give birth to 2.1 children for the society to replace itself. That's a biological fact. It's not a political fact. It's not even a fact I prefer. It's not something I wish to be the case. It is the case. We are mammals and we must comply to certain mammalian norms. And one is every single woman has to give birth to 2.1 children. And the mm-hmm. point one is to allow for those for infertility. And that's the destiny of women. They must give birth to women, uh, to children. And b- 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 say women, they yes. have to give birth to boys and girls. And that's, that's not a choice matter. This is an inflexible rule of biology. Unless we accept that, we are going to create an entirely perverse and perverted set of values with the resultant disaster that Europe is already facing. Every single European country, without exception, is failing to reproduce itself. And where you have demographic growth at all, as you have in Denmark and France, is because of immigration. But that link between sex and procreation and the female biology has been well and truly broken, I'm sure you would agree, in this country at least. It has been broken Mm. and ruinously. Now, I'm part of the process of ruination because I welcomed the whole concept of separation of sex and reproduction, as I would have done being Mm. the generation I was. I didn't perceive, and almost nobody did perceive, although the Catholic Church did in Humanae Vitae in, in 1968, that the two are intimately related. And if you separate the two, disaster will follow. That's what Humanae Vitae was about. It was about the life of human beings. It's not about sexual pleasure. It's about the need for the species to reproduce itself. And one of the unfortunate things about the biology that we have and the nature that we have is that women have to give birth to children. There is nobody else to do it. It's going to be women. Men are not going to do it. Science is not going to do it. Tadpoles are not going to do it for us. We have to do it ourselves, or rather women have to do it. And that's the nature of the mammalian norm that we are. And unless we recognise that, we are heading for the disaster that's already besetting countries as far apart as Norway and Denmark and Germany. And, and, and Spain is looking at a complete catastrophe. Its, its, its birth rate is 1.4 per, uh, per family, per, 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 per couple, which is 0.7 below what it should be. So essentially we're talking about a birth rate half of what is, reproduct- of what is a re- replacement level. Well, perhaps we're moving now from the past into the future and maybe you will continue on this thread, but I'll ask you next what you see, first of all, as Ireland's single biggest opportunity. Uh, uh, Ireland has already lost, squandered, abandoned the possibility of creating a future of its own. We sneered at the, the British, or rather the English, for wanting to have a society over which they had some control. But what would, can Ireland still retrieve that? What would Ireland no, have to do now? I don't, I don't think Ireland has any mood for that, any appetite for that. I think the opportunity has been lost. I don't think there's any evidence of liberalism or tolerance or interest or curiosity or inquiry into what was going on within the English. And the English are about 40 years ahead of us when it comes to dealing with the consequence of immigration. And the, the, the Brexit vote wasn't about uh, just Commonwealth, Im- uh, sorry, it wasn't just about European immigration, it was a reaction to uncontrolled Commonwealth immigration. And so are you saying that there was an opportunity, the, oppor- the time has passed when that opportunity could have I, been taken? I'm saying just that. Uh, w- the, there was a, a, the, the, the moment for elucidation, for serious analysis, for exchange of information and exchange of opinions occurred during the the Brexit uh, crisis, as it became a crisis, uh, when we could have said, well, why are the English doing that? What's happening in English life that's making working class people in, in, in much of England say, well, actually, we don't like what's happening to us. Give us our country back. Now, this was, these were serious questions which the Irish people in particular should have been asking about themselves. I'm, I'm the first to acknowledge that the one of the first, to acknowledge that the, the, the desire for um, Irish separatism is, is morally laudable and politically justified. And that's true for, uh, uh, about separatism from the British Empire as it is from the European Empire. But what we've done is we've exchanged um, subject to subjection to the, the, the crown of, of Britain to the, the Treaty of Rome initially uh, and Uh, and now to the European Union generally, so that we are now destined for membership of a single state. Now, I don't believe that's going to happen. I believe that the European Union will fall apart, but not because of anything the Irish do. So if we'd been having this conversation maybe a year or two ago, you would have still seen the possibility of an opportunity 
before Brexit happened of Ireland re-evaluating its position. But now that opportunity has passed. I think that that term re-evaluation is absolutely vital. I think that was a time for us to recognise that we are at a serious crossroads. We've got part of the island which is going to remain part of the United Kingdom, legislatively and economically mm. perhaps. And it's a very complex issues that are going to result from Brexit or UK exit, as I prefer to call it, because you, if you call it Brexit, it means you're not talking about Northern Ireland. It's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which is vital for us. We could have asked serious questions and our political classes and our media classes t- decided instead to sneer. Did you see any attempt at a, at a, a proper discussion Or was it all 100% attack, attack, attack? There was no attempt whatever. It was all attack. It was condescension. It was sneering. It's one of the characteristics uh, that someone like you perhaps might not appreciate. um, And it's understood by outsiders. And I say you because you are 100% Irish and I'm not. I'm I'm, I'm kind of um, disconnected Irish. Um, That When I arrived in UCD, University College Dublin, I got an unbroken diet of moral superiority from my fellow students. That Irishness was infinitely superior to the Englishness that they saw I was representative of. I personally had had brought about partition. I mean, how many students blamed me for partition? I was 19 years of age. So the Irish were morally superior in every sense. To Absolutely. The if you read the newspapers for the, uh, for the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and that's what the, the newspapers were full of. The Irish Press and Irish Independent particularly. Not less so the Irish Times. What, what was the basis of that superiority? What were the elements of it, do you think? Because this was the heartland of Catholicism. So more, so than, yeah. more so than... And that moral superiority has shifted from being based on religion to uh, embracing the values of of the EU. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church has given way to the Treaty of Rome as a basis for moral superiority. There's no reason for Irish people to believe they're in any sense morally superior to anyone anywhere. There's no value for that. Do you think there is still a general belief that we are? Subconscious, yes. Mm. So some, but look at the, the, the popularity of songs. If you listen to RT broadcasters going on, I sure aren't we great? Aren't we a great, grand, little, great little country? That kind of non stop, m- mediocre, intellectually trite rubbish. And it's part of the, 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 the particularly RTE, aren't we a great little, little country? Uh, isn't it great being Irish? Well, Enda Kenny had a famous phrase the greatest small country for doing business in, I think, was his slogan. Well, that was a reasonably economic, uh, as an economic observation, that wasn't wrong, actually. Uh, I mean, it's not as good as Singapore or an awful lot of countries, but it's not, it's not bad. It doesn't actually elevate Irishness as being superior to other, uh, other societies or so what you find in other societies. But culturally, um, it's a pretty uninteresting society. We, we've got virtually no theatre. Um, no indigenous theatre, very little uh, poetry to speak of, very little fiction. When you consider that not because of membership of the uh, British Empire or the, or the or membership of the United Kingdom, the numbers of Nobel Prize winners that we had born in Ireland and numbers of bo- Nobel Prizes we've had since we had independence, no, n- no one born in the 26 counties of Ireland has won a Nobel Prize since independence. Not one. For anything? Or for literature? For anything. Okay. I, Look, I, Seamus Heaney was born in North. Northern Ireland, Beckett. educated in Northern Ireland. How was Beckett born? Beckett was born before independence. independence. Correct. Okay. Well, and Beckett just is an interesting example of what Irishness can be. I mean, he was a heroic opponent of the Third Reich. He joined the French mm, resistance for mm, which mm. he would have been executed. Yes. But who was the great um, writer who was celebrated in... In, in Irish life in the, the 1970s and 90s, Francis, well, Francis Stewart. Stewart. Oh, yes, yeah. Francis Stewart was an explicit ally of the Third Reich. He went to Germany in 1940. He allied himself with a state that had said that the leader of that state in, in January 1939 said in the event of war, the Jewish population of Europe will be exterminated. Now, this was not some secret promise. It was repeated on the f- front page of the Irish Times on January 31st, 1939. This creature, mm. this vile piece of rubbish, threw in his lot with the Third Reich and then became a literary icon in Ireland yes. in the post-war years. I suppose we've always had a, an ambiguous relationship with Germany going back to 
Our gallant allies. Our gallant in allies in 1916. Yeah. And in 1946 or 47, Dublin Corporation allocated a site. Sean South, was it? No, no, Sean South was a different man altogether. Okay. He was killed in 1956 in a raid on... Um, uh, on a, a RUC station in Northern Ireland, um, the, um, the, the an IRA leader who died yes. a, in, in, in a submarine coming to Ireland yes. in 1940. Yes. I, 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 the Dublin Corporation gave a, 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 a site for him to uh, raise a statue in his honour, and it's still there in in Fairview Park. Really? Well, we've we've missed the opportunity, but can we now come to the final element? What do you see as the greatest threat facing the, the, the threats? are conjoined. It's a failure for the political and cultural and media establishments to address what it is to be Irish, to presume that because you're born in Ireland that you are now Irish, as we know from events in London, this is not remotely true. Um, the sheer cowardice involved in this. The first six babies born in Ireland in on the first day of 2020, of those six, five were of foreign um, origin, of foreign parentage. Now, this gave us an opportunity to discuss what's happening to Ireland, but no, what all the newspapers said without exception, they were the new Irish. Now, you could go to perhaps hundreds of thousands of people born in, in Britain of Muslim background who would say to them, say to you, well, actually, no, our first loyalty is Islam. Now, similarly, you'll have hundreds of thousands of Muslims saying, well, no, my first loyalty is to Britain. The Home Secretary in Britain is, is, is of Islamic background and a couple of other cabinet ministers of, of Isla Islamic background because, it, because you're Muslim doesn't mean you're um, you don't identify with the country in which you were born. What is necessary is for have to ha us to have an open conversation about this and a realistic one. Um, but because you can't actually exalt uh, the goodness of being Irish, and it's not particularly special, but it's good. It's like the saying the Norwegians will say it's good to be Norwegian, it, and the Swedes will say the same thing about being Swedish and Danish and so on. We all know what I'm talking about. Um, so, but if you're not allowed to say that, then you can't even discuss the nature of identity and you can't even discuss the virtues or lack of virtues of immigration. And because of that, and because of the false notion that because you're born in Ireland necessarily, the consequence is an Irish person, means that there is no serious conversation at all about this. It's not as if there's a, a light conversation or a slight conversation. There is no conversation. The subject is taboo. Anyone who wants to raise it is immediately, as I've said, a bigot and a person who should belong to the, you know, the, to the forces of darkness. You're, you're painting a picture which suggests that there are really only two choices now between being a nationalist or a globalist. If you're a nationalist, you embody all those things you talked about and you express a, a pride in the country. And if you're a globalist, you don't see any difference between Irish people and anybody else. So uh, is there any other route that people can take? Well, the, uh, to Theresa, May, to Theresa May said, um, if you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. And I, I believe in that. The world is a meaningless abstraction. It has no virtue, no values. It's, it's merely a species identification in terms of human, human beings, not as an identity identification where you can recognise certain characteristics as belonging to a certain location. So Spain, Morocco, Algeria, Siberia, everywhere has characteristics. And there's nothing wrong with people who are living in those areas saying, well, actually, we want people who come here pretty much to conform with the characteristics they find here. They can enrich those characteristics. They can add a certain amount of diversity. But diversity itself is not uh, an advantage, not a virtue, as the way it's being portrayed in the, the dogmatic norms in the BBC and in British life. And we only have to look at British life uh, to see that the catastrophe that's resulted from the obsession with, with diversity, where you have uh, perhaps over half the advertisements on British television, certainly English television, will consist of people entirely of ethnically non-British background. There'll be but the people of African or Asian origin. So that you'd think an outsider, a Martian arriving in Britain, would think that Britain was essentially uh, a non-white society. Now, even to, to raise this issue is to invite accusations of racism. Well, you know, so what? 
you're going to be called racist or xenophobe or misogynistic or something or other, whatever you say these days, because those are the, the terms which are used to silence any sort of scepticism or dissent. And I'm talking about scepticism before you reach dissent. You've got to have a sceptic before you can have a proper dialogue. And then the dialogue will lead to a proper conversation. And you might then decide at the end of that conversation, having heard the viewpoints, different viewpoints, that the original position you had, your original scepticism, was unjustified. And you might say, well, actually, you know, those are good points, well made, mm -hmm. and I, I now... Uh, retreat from the position I held. I can see I was mistaken and misinformed and I had a wrong set of values. That can't happen while you have this doctrinaire uni view on the world, just a view that consists entirely of one set of values, intolerant of any other and intolerant most of all of dissent and, uh, and dialogue. And I, 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 you know, it's in, in, in that sense, because Ireland uh, in, in, in its own peculiar way was a pioneer of the new intolerance. So that Europe, generally speaking, the European Union and the United States political and legal establishment have gone down the path that you can't discuss anything without being a neo-Nazi. That any time you want to, for the United States of America, for example, there was the famous events in Charlottesburg where mm. um, there was a, a statue, for a Civil War statue of a, a, a Confederate general. That event was so misrepresented by the media. It was one another event that came to me as a, an indication that the media is so corrupt that it's almost be, be, beyond, beyond redemption. That one lunatic turned up wearing with a, a, a Nazi flag. Now, the Nazi flag has no cultural or political significance, whatever in the United States of America. But this one man turned up with the flag, several thousand people were there, and every single media report say that neo-Nazi flags were in evidence. One man had a flag that might have been a neo-Nazi, one man. But all media reports re refer to multiplicity of of, of, uh, of Nazi flags. Mm -hmm. This is not the case, it's another media lie. But that, that, that those events can't be discussed any more than any other event in the cultural war could be discussed if it's on the wrong side of righteousness. Maybe the last question then, and I think I know the answer, is any of this fixable or are we on a trajectory that is not stoppable? All trajectories do end somewhere or other. It's not going to be stoppable in my lifetime as far as I can see. I, I'd be surprised if it, 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 they, the trajectory you're on can be reversed in the lifetime of someone who's, say, middle-aged, which I'm no longer, unfortunately, no longer am. But um, all, all paths do come to an end. The, 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 the Reformation essentially came to an end. That took hundreds of years. Mm. I don't think this is going to last that long. What's happening is... Because Western post-Christian secular societies are not reproducing themselves, we're not producing enough children, we are importing people who are going to have different values from ours. And the, the people who will take over a responsibility for running the Irish state, just the same as people running, uh, taking over the responsibility of running all European states, will have different value systems. They might be Muslim, uh, they might be Hindu, they might be... Well, they're not going to be Jewish, because one of the catastrophes of of uh, recent decades has been that Jews of Europe have found themselves increasingly uncomfortable because of the threat, mm. basically from Islamic extremists. It's not from Christian right wing, although mm. people like to pretend it is. It's Islamic extremists in, 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 in France in particular, which has, have caused many French Jews to move to Israel. I'm a defender of Israel, but I'm equally a defender of a society which will respect and cherish the presence of mm. Jews in their midst. So the, the, the short term to your answer, a short question, answer to your question, is that the, there, are, there are no signs that the, the, the road is going to be turning any way soon in my lifetime. And in fact, the demographic pattern would suggest it's going to continue on the path that it is um, heading for. That's it for today. I would like to thank Kevin Myers for sharing his thoughts with us. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Please join us for our next show, which will be coming up soon. Goodbye.